OK, so thanks very much. And many thanks to the organizers for the invitation to talk in this very nice conference. Um, so I'll talk about two topics. I think the first leads fairly naturally into the second. So the first is um, set homogeneous structures. And then that will lead on towards talking about orbit equivalent permutation groups. Um, I'm really talking about material in about three joint papers. So, so on this material, there's an old paper from, I think, uh, well, it was 1994, of Manfred Droster, Michel Giraudet, um, myself, and Norbert Sauer, um, 1994. And then looked at it again, the topic more, more recently, in a paper with um, Bob Gray, and myself, and Cheryl Prager, and Gordon Royal. So I guess that was last year. Um, so I'll be talking about results from both of these. And then this material, this is a, an, old, an older topic. In finite permutation group theory, there's quite a long literature on looking at pairs of permutation groups on a given set with the same orbits on finite sets. That's really what it's talking about. There's, there's an old literature on this. I'll be talking about a recent paper with Debbie Lockett. Um, so this was this year. OK. so. Begin with a definition of what I mean by this. So we'll say that I'll generally be working over a finite relational language. So L, finite relational, except when it isn't. Um, and I'll, I'll say that um, a, a countable, countable L structure M is set homogeneous. So this means that if two finite substructures are isomorphic, then there is some automorphism taking one to the other, but not requiring that every isomorphism extends. So it's a weakening of homogeneity, maybe less natural. I mean, it's less suited to sort of back and forth kind of arguments. Um, just as a, as a quick sort of example, you could just take, say, the rationals equipped with, say, I guess, the ternary relation x less than y less than z. So the ternary relation doesn't see pairs of distinct elements. So a any pair of distinct elements are isomorphic. Uh, um, but, but, you could, but no automorphism of this structure can reverse, say, 0 and 1. So the difference between um, set homogeneity and homogeneity is that set, homogene set homogeneity doesn't require that on a given finite structure, the full automorphism group is induced. That's what we're really talking about. So first of all, a couple of situations where, where one can fairly easily see that they're equivalent. So and what, what one example is, is uh, quite old, uh, sort of the situation of Philip Hall's universal locally finite group. So that's a, a countable locally finite group, which embeds all finite groups. And um, a, any isomorphism between two finite groups is induced by an automorphism, in fact, by conjugation. Um, so one, one, one would get the same object if you just required set homogeneity. So if G is countable locally finite um, set homogeneous, is a, is a well, set homogeneous group um, and embeds all finite groups. then G is homogeneous. And I think this is, is well known. Um, 
So, because uh, this is a group, I'm slightly deviating from this setting of a relational language, but it doesn't matter. Um, so the point here is we just have to check that um, in a group with this property, the, um, on any finite subgroup of G, the full automorphism group is induced. But the point is, supposing, supposing you've got some finite um, F subgroup of G, well, somewhere um, you're going to have a copy um, F, say, extended by the automorphism group of F. That's also a finite group. So somewhere that will embed in G. And, and so there'll be a copy of F with the full automorphism group of G induced. And so the same thing holds to the original one. So that's one situation where the two notions coincide. So I didn't, with this definition, I didn't insist that M was countably infinite. I'm, I'm allowing it to be finite. And there's another situation where the notions coincide. It was, a, it was a result of, I think, Ronce in um, 1978. Uh -huh. And then uh, there's a nice proof by Enomoto in 1981 that any finite, any finite set homogeneous graph is homogeneous. So it's one of the list classified by Gardner and others. Um, so I will, I will just describe the argument here. It's a very short argument, and quite, quite nice. But it, it really only seems to work for, for graphs and for tournaments. So our, we imagine we have um, our set homogeneous graph. We'll call it gamma. Um, and you imagine you've got, this is, this is finite, you've got isomorphic subgraphs A and B, and we've got, we've got some isomorphism phi, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, I'll call it uh, yeah, phi from A to B. Okay. We want to extend phi to an automorphism. All we're told is gamma is set homogeneous. So we want to extend phi A to B to some Automorphism of gamma. Well, because gamma is finite, all you need to do is to show in this situation you can do a one-point extension, and then you, then you keep doing it. Okay, so you have to explain why you can do a one-point extension. Well, essentially, you choose a vertex A in gamma, which is joined to as many vertices of capital A as possible. You maximize that, and actually, it, things are symmetric between A and B. So I'll assume that also that, that number is at least as big as any corresponding number for B. So I'll choose A vertex of gamma such that gamma of A, that's the, na the neighbor set of A, intersect A as large as possible. And I won't write it down, but I'm assuming that's greater than or equal to any gamma B intersect B. Okay. So this is the, the NMOTA argument I'm giving. Um, <coughs> OK, so put A primed equal to gamma of A intersect A, and B primed will be its image under phi. So the picture's a bit small. I'll make it a bit bigger. Um, this is my A primed, and I've got a vertex A joined to all of this. And I've got a corresponding B primed in there. OK. <coughs> so now, of course, A primed is an isomorphic to B primed. Gamma is set homogeneous. So the sum automorphism of gamma taking A primed to B primed. So, <coughs> so, by, so A primed is isomorphic to B primed because phi takes A primed to B primed. So there exists an automorphism of the whole of gamma such that uh, A primed to the G equals B primed. 
So, of course, that means that the number of common neighbors of A primed in the whole graph is the same as the number of common neighbors of B primed in the whole graph. <coughs> so, the number, the size of the sets of all x in B gamma, x joined to the whole of B primed, equals the corresponding thing for A primed. Okay. Uh, <coughs> And now, also, we have, this automorphi we have this isomorphism phi from A to B. So that takes common neighbors of A prime within A to neighbors of B prime within B. So those numbers are the same. <coughs> so <coughs> we can say that um, because of phi, Um, the number of such vertices in A, so that is vertices of this sort, so common neighbors of A prime within A equals the number of the number of such vertices in B. So hence, there must be some vertex outside B joined to all of B prime. So hence, there exists some B out here joined to all of B primed. And by my maximality at the start, B couldn't be joined to anything else in there. And so you can extend. So hence, suitable B exists. That's a very short, but short argument. But it's really using just that you have um, just essentially two, two types. So the same argument works. For, to for tournaments, so the same argument works for finite tournaments, but it doesn't seem to go any further. And just if you start looking at finite digraphs, you already hit a, hit a problem. If you simply look at the example, a directed five cycle, not a very deep example. Um, that's set homogeneous, but not homogeneous. Um, set homogeneous, but, you, but a pair like that, um, that, there's no automorphism of the digraph taking that pair to reverse, reversing that pair. So this is set homogeneous, not homogeneous. OK. <coughs> So, so the first thing I want to think about a bit is what we can say just in this finite context um, about, uh, about sort of, say, finite, finite set homogeneous structures. And the hope, I suppose, might, and this I think is perhaps a bit naive, might be some variant of the kind of Lachlan theory that if you fix a finite relational language, then the set homogeneous finite structures should fall into finitely many little sporadics and finitely many infinite families. Um, I, I don't see any real reason why that, that should go through. You'd have, you'd have to kind of be able to translate it into the homogeneous structure setting. But at, le at least we do get a result of that sort in, in obvious test cases, which would be digraphs. Um, so we have a, a class. This is, this is the work with uh, Bob Gray, Shell Prager, Gordon Royal. We have a classification. Um, of finite set homogeneous digraphs. So this, this is really revisiting um, a paper of Lachlan's from 1981. I, gu I guess this was when he was kind of testing the waters for what the possibilities were of general results that finite homogeneous structures in a finite relational language. So he was getting classifications in, in simple languages. So he, he classified homogeneous, finite homogeneous digraphs in two situations. So 
where you, where you have um, just the, the two types like that, and where you have um, that, so where, where, you're, where, you're, where you're, you're allowed pairs with an arc in both directions. <laughs> so we essentially do the same. We sort of describe, say, finite set of Jewish diagraphs in both situations, in particular in this situation here. So I'll say something about that. So, uh, <coughs> so this is the situation um, allowing all of these three times. Uh, all of, um, so that, that, and that. So it turns out there that um, you, the kind of the pattern of the kind of I guess sort of the Lockham theory is followed. You get you get a few sporadic examples and some infinite families, uh, and there are there are some there's quite a lot more that you get under set homogeneity that you, that you don't get under homogeneity. Um, so you get four extra sporadics. So in particular, there's a, there's a curious one, which is a sort of, uh, e.g., a, a 27 vertex, um, so triple cover of K9. So it's kind of, it's, it's, co it's closely related to a, a disintransitive graph. It turn, turns out in this setting. And you also get three infinite families. Um, so for example, that, that little thing, we call this cycle, we call this D5. Once, once you're allowed um, this relation as well, you can replicate this. So you could imagine something where you have, say, um, a whole bunch of copies <laughs> of D5. A whole lot of copies with all undirected arcs between them in all possible ways. Yeah, you, you, you can do that kind of thing. So we, we would call that, I guess, um, Kn of D5. So that turns up as an example. And likewise, you get D5 of Kn. So you reverse the roles of those. And there's a third family that shows up. Uh, I'll say something about um, the, the proof of this classification. I won't tell you what the classification is, but I'll say something about the proof. Because, I mean, there's a sense in which it kind of feels like an inductive process which could be pushed further, but it, but it becomes rather intricate. Um, so it's a, it's a strategy of the proof. <coughs> so I mean, it, it's inductive. So you first of all have to guess the final list. And so so the, the, the proof kind of changes as the list gets longer. <laughs> Uh, um, so anyway, uh, so it's, it's induction, inductive on the size of your, I'm, I'm calling my, my, I'll call it M, structure M. Um, I'll, I'll call it, uh, yeah. So you fix the vertex A, and you look at the, the out neighbors of A, we call this gamma of A, and you look at the, the in neighbors of A. Well, that's gamma plus of A. This will be gamma minus of A. Um, <coughs> now, easily, these are both sets homogeneous. Um, I mean, if, if you had say, two isomorphic pieces there, then consider this piece with A dominating them and this piece with A dominating that. They're again isomorphic. So as the whole thing is set homogeneous, there'll be some automorphism taking A together with this to A together with that. Because A dominates the rest, it'll fix A. So you can, you can fix A and take that to that. And that, that, that does it within gamma plus of A. These are set homogeneous, so these belong to the list, which we have in advance. So they belong to the list. But also, there are easy counting arguments, so they're kind of familiar in permutation groups, which say that these have the same size. <coughs> so uh, also, 
gamma plus of a the same size as gamma minus a. And, and also, it's quite hard for them to be isomorphic. If, it, if they're isomorphic, supposing gamma plus of a was isomorphic to gamma minus of a, then there, would, then there would be some automorphism of the whole digraph, taking gamma plus of a to gamma minus of a. And that must move a. So it must move a to, some, to something else, some a prime, say, which dominates gamma minus and is dominated by gamma plus. And essentially, that gives you some equivalence relation. You, you get some equivalence relation where A and A prime are related. And that gives you very, very strong structure. And you, you can, one can always sort of classify in that situation. So you can fairly rapidly you can arrange that gamma plus of A is not isomorphic to gamma minus of A. It's not isomorphic. So they're, they're from a given list. They're the same size, not isomorphic. And that restricts possibilities tightly. And then by ad hoc arguments, and this will push it through. So I just, I just sort of, that, that's essentially all I'll say about the finite situation. I'll just leave hanging the question whether there is any possibility of a version of the Lockhorn theory uh, in a general finite relational language where you say that the, set of, the finite set homogeneous structures fall into finitely many infinite families and finitely many mistakes. Um. <clears throat> so I'll now turn to countably infinite set of homogeneous structures. So that example I mentioned at the beginning of Q with a relation, ternary relation x less than y less than z is the kind of silly example to bear in mind. Um, well, again, I, I don't have any, any sort of general handle on this. There, there is, you, 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 can, you can formulate a version of Fresse's theorem for this context. It's in the, our earlier paper with Manfred and Michel Giraudet and Norbert Sauer. Um, so there's a notion of, Twisted amalgamation. Um, where you, you have some class C, uh, a class of finite structures. So we'll call this the twisted amalgamation property. Um, so this would say, um, given, say, A, B1, B2, in the class and um, embeddings fi from a to bi, given that data, um, there exists some d in the class and embeddings um, and embeddings gi from the bi to c to d, sorry, and some automorphism of the base thing um, and some h in aught a, that's the extra, that's the twist, such that um, if you compose f1 and g1, you get the same answer as composing f2 and g2, but first doing h. So twisting on one side. Um, so you, I mean, if, if you, if you f once you've formulated that, um, you, you essentially get the same statement of Fresnel's theorem. So you get the existence and uniqueness, everything that should be true comes out. But um, this, to me, this seems like a hard condition to work with. I, mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I can't imagine classifying amalgamation, sort of twisted amalgamation classes of, of graphs using this. I, I don't know. Um, I wanted to sort of um, gen other sort of general remarks about this notion. I should have said explicitly, of course, in the setting I have, um, this condition th this condition implies only categoricity. Um, 
No, I mean, un if it's set homogeneous in a finite relational language, then you're going to have finite many orbits on intervals. And so, by Rilm Zewski, we're, de we're dealing with only categorical structures. It also, it also implies model completeness. Um, this, I mean, I think it, it, it comes out of the proof here. I think you can see it in various ways. It's actually mentioned in, in different words. It's mentioned in Fresse's book, Theory of Relations. I, I, think, I think it's probably originally due to Maurice Pouze. Um, you, get, you get model completeness out of this. Um, but I think that's virtually all I know in sort of complete generality about, about this notion. So what can we say in particular cases um, sort of, of so it's homogeneous graphs or digraphs. <coughs> I mean, I mean, you can, you can, again, you can formulate some rather general questions. I mean, um, for example, is every, can every set homogeneous graph be made homogeneous by adding finite many relations to the language? There are obvious questions of this sort, which I can't answer. Um, all we have is some beginning sort of classification results under extra hypotheses. I'll say something about that. Um, <coughs> so, so, first of all, as a result, from the paper uh, with Drost, um, and Manfred, Michel Giraudet, myself, and, and Norbert Sauer, Giraudet. Um, uh, that if, if, if gamma is a, a set homogeneous, and now thinking countably infinite, um, graph which is not three homogeneous, In other words, homogeneity already fails with sets of size at most three. In fact, it means it's size exactly three. Um, then you can describe exactly what happens. So then gamma is isomorphic to what we called R3 or R3 complement. Um, so what is this? This is something which um, sort of already, I think, it was, was around in, in Claude's talk yesterday, in a slightly different guise. Um, so related to the local order construction. So you take um, points, count many points, densely on the, un on the unit circle. So you count many points, densely on the unit circle. And you, I mean, for the local order, we ruled out pairs that were antipodal. This time, we rule out pairs that make an angle of 2 pi by 3 at the center. So no two making an angle of 2 pi by 3 at the center. And then you, then you, then you just say that two vertices are adjacent if the angle they make at the center is bigger than 2 pi by 3. So this vertex will be adjacent to a section like that. And th that's R3. I think actually in the paper, this is R3 complement, but <laughs> same thing. Um, so so that, that's this example. Uh, and that's set homogeneous, but not homogeneous. Um, so essentially, um, the, the, I mean, see it's not, to see it's not homogeneous, um, actually, I'll, I'll just write down the edge relation. So you just say x joined to y if the angle at the center is greater than 2 pi by 3. I say it's th things here joined to things up there. So the point essentially is that if, if you take, say, an independent set of size 3, some, say a triple like that, then the middle point is special. 
You can't see that within the set of size 3, but the middle point is special. So there's, there's no vertex, um, to get this right, which is, I guess, a, which is, I guess, which is adjacent to these two, but not to that, is that way around. So this, this one is special. So that's the point. So, uh, for, uh, for set homogeneous graphs, so that's essentially where our knowledge stops, just, just as a classification under, under the strong assumption that of not three homogeneous. And I, I mean, the, the sort of thing you'd like to do is to show that under set homogeneity, say any finite complete subgraph had the full symmetric group induced, things like this. And I, I, I can see no, no method for tackling that. So carry on in this vein. I mean, um, Can you make some yeah. I was meditating inwardly. I was meditating inwardly. Yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, can't, I, I, can't, I can't think of any statement that I believe. <laughs> um, you, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, you could, you could hope that um, you could hope this is all. That, that's, that, that might be reasonable. This is all. What's wrong with that? Um, I'm sure. Right wrong. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Make that a con make that a conjecture. That that, that this, this is all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's the Simon Thomas principle. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um just continuing um in the the digraph sort of direction. Um so for digra digraphs, um, this paper with um, Bob Gray, myself, and Cheryl Prager, and Gordon Royal, um, we did something sort of similar, um, just looking at um, set homogeneous digraphs which, which fail to be homogeneous at a very low level. I also looked at the tournaments in that setting. And so the result here is that, so let M be a <coughs> capital infinite um, set homogeneous digraph, which is not too homogeneous. But again, you get a classification. Um, so then, well, either M is isomorphic to a specific object, <laughs> we're calling T4, which is very analogous to the circular thing up there, um, or um, M isomorphic to what we're calling R sub N for some N, for some N at least two. Uh, so I'll say what these are. So the T4, um, so this digraph, again, cat many points, density on the unit circle, no two making an angle, I guess, of, of pi by two. So um, no two points at an angle of pi by two at the center. Uh, so we're, we're, rul we're ruling out this picture. And then you just say that um, x arrow y, if 
if, if the shortest distance, is, uh, if, if, if the angle is, is if, if the angle is less than pi by two, and shortest distance is clockwise, shortest route is, is clockwise. So the picture is arcs locally like that. So that gives you, again, a, a canonical object. Um, it's something which is homogeneous in a finite binary language. But just in the digraph language, all you get is, is, is it's heterogeneous. So it's, <coughs> so it's, it's not too homogeneous. So that, that's basically the, um, the unique primitive example. But you also get a, fam a family here of imprimitive examples. So what are the RNs? <coughs> So for the RNs, so uh, <coughs> let um, Q, uh, I'll, just, I'll just say QI, um, I equals 1 up to N. Partition Q into dense codense sets. Um, and you write. A arrow B, if A is less than B, and they don't lie in the same QI, um, and there does not exist any I with A, B, and QI. So the picture here. Are we with uh, no, no, so not with symmetric edges, no. The, set, the setting of your. Yeah, 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 sorry, yeah. So as a picture, you've got essentially copies of Q. Uh, within each piece, there's, there is no structure. There are no, there are no arcs. But you've got um, arcs angling downwards between pieces. That's a picture. So again, that's um, set homogeneous, not too homogeneous, essentially because for a pair within the same piece, um, there's, there's no relation on them, but you can separate them by looking outside. OK. So again, the question, is this all? And uh, may, maybe, if you want to conjecture, that's all. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, OK. I'm sorry? So, so the conjecture would. The conjecture would, would be that any um, countably infinite set homogeneous digraph is either homogeneous, so in Greg's list, or is one, or is one of these. But that's, it has the feeling of just we haven't looked hard enough yet. <laughs> um, and you have to do something extra about the time of those two locations. I think that's, uh, I think that's okay. Oh, um, so, oh, so you mean for finite, for finite. Are finite things and the well, the finite things are, are classified. That was right. Yeah, yeah. So the conjecture would be true. You have to consider all that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yes. That's what I mean. Yes. Sure. <laughs> 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 you have to be true, do you? I won't, I won't really I won't go into the kind of arguments for, for these results, but essentially you're just recovering very information about very small configurations um, what embeds and by, by knowing what sort of say binary ternary configurations embed, you can piece together the whole structure that, that's, that's the spirit of it um, so I mean, I want now to sort of lead on towards the questions about orbit equivalence. So the kind of intermediate question, which would be, um, so given 
homogeneous a homogeneous structure M, what uh, oh, well can say ought M have closed proper subgroups which act set homogeneously on M. In the, in the natural sense that if two finite substructures are, are isomorphic, then some element of this subgroup should take one to the other. Um, so we started thinking, I guess myself and Debbie Lockett, started thinking about this sort of question. And then it became clear that really the, the kind of homogeneous structure context was, was not playing much of a role. Um, so, so, we, so we dropped that as the, the, the homogeneity as an assumption. Well, it, it certainly seemed that the arguments weren't really using the kind of Alexander categorical kind of context. Um, so <coughs> this leads on to this notion of orbit equivalence. So, say, we're given, say, G1, G2 acting on some given set X. We say G1 and G2 are orbit equivalent if for every K they have the same orbits on the collection of unordered K element subsets of X. So if for all, for finite k, they have the same orbits on, I'll write it as x, square brackets k, so um, unordered k subsets. So one or two observations on this. Um, so, so back to this setting, what it's really asking is, can ought M be orbit equivalent to some closed proper subgroup? Yeah. So in this setting, observe that um, if, if G1 is orbit equivalent to G2, then both are orbit equivalent to the group generated by the, pro by the two. So one might as well look at pa pairs where one is containing, one is containing the other. Um, so reduce the pairs to orbit equivalent pairs H contained in, or contained in G, contained in some X. And as an example, um, you can take, say, um, AN contained in SN. In the natural action. And I guess I need N at least three. Yeah. <coughs> I'll give an example. What can one say here? Um, so, of course, um, immediate observations that, that um, uh, if, if G and H are in this situation where G and H are orbit equivalent, you're going to get that G is transitive um, if and only if H is transitive. That's one transitive, that's automatic. But also, 
G is primitive on X if and only if H is primitive on X. So this notion of primitivity, I guess, hasn't really risen yet. It's meeting. So a permutation group is primitive on X if there is no proper non-trivial equivalence relation on X which is preserved by G. So, <coughs> yeah, um, it's very easy to see that, um, it, uh, that, that, that this holds, that um, orbit equivalence implies that both or neither are primitive. So what's known on this notion? Well, th there's, there's now a, there's now a, a classification of pairs um, H, I say, distinct containing G of finite um, primitive orbit equivalent pairs. So this is due to Akos Sheresh um, in 1997. Um, it comes out of um, earlier work from, from the 80s. Um, essen uh, essentially, the point is that if you're looking at finite primitive permutation, you've got a, a group G acting on a set X. Then you can look at the, the induced action of G on the power set of X. And nearly always, G has a regular orbit on the power set of X. So that's an orbit on subsets of X on which G is sharply one transitive. So if it fixes some subset, then it fixes everything in the orbit. Uh, so that, that's a kind of pretty ubiquitous phenomenon, that there's a regular orbit on the power set. Now, if G has a regular orbit on the power set, and H is a proper subgroup of G, that orbit must break up. And so they can't be orbit equivalent. Um, <coughs> so So the, the kind of procedure for this is, is, is to sort of first um, classify um, groups or primitive groups so X finite um, with no regular orbit. on the power set of X. So, that, so that's a relatively small list. And, and, and so I, I think it was already known um, in the 80s that apart from symmetric not groups, there were only finitely many examples. And then, and then Sheras looked at all of those. Uh, so, for, so once you've got this, then this, this comes fairly rapidly, I think. Uh, and it's using, it's using the kind of standard methods for finite primitive groups, so classification of finite symbol groups, the nan scott theorem. Yeah, I mean, explicit list for very, for very small ones, sure, sure, yeah. So what can one say about infinite orbit equivalent groups? Well, here, you really have to be talking about closed groups, closed permutation groups. I mean, for example, note that, say, the, the finitary symmetric group on omega, the group of permutations of finite support, is, I'll, I'll just write orbit equivalent for orbit equivalent for this orbit equivalent, right? So this is orbit equivalent to the full symmetric group. Now, the, the same orbits on finite sets. So, I mean, the um, general, for example, um, automorphic groups, omega categorical structures have lots of dense proper subgroups. So, I mean, one can't hope to say anything sensible there, I think. So, we consider um, 
uh, closed, uh, so, so pairs of closed orbit equivalent H contained in G contained in sin X, X infinite. So what can I hope to say? So, I mean, just as, as one example, bear in mind, um, ought Q less than is going to be orbit equivalent to using this notation to sim Q. They have the same orbits, so they're both transitive on unordered K element sets. And of course, the other redux of Q less than, their automorphism groups, will be or, orbit equivalent to this. So, that, so that's an example. But essentially, our conjecture is that, is that that's all. Um, under primitivity. So the, the theorem, <coughs> so this is Debbie Lockett, myself. So suppose um, <coughs> H contained in G are orbit equivalent and closed um, on some infinite set X. I mean, countability doesn't play a role here. Um, and G is primitive, but not too transitive. So it's not transitive on pair, ordered pairs of distinct elements. Then H equals G. Um, <coughs> So we, we do actually need this assumption here that one's contained in the other. It has to, has to be phrased like that. Um, <coughs> and I will actually be less of a coward and make a conjecture <laughs> here. Um, so the conjecture would be that um, if H and G, if H less than G are distinct orbit equivalent um, primitive and closed on infinite x, then they're exactly of this kind. So then, well, well I'll, say, I'll say countably infinite x, on countably infinite x. Um, then, H and G belong to the list of reduct, automorphisms of reducts of, of Q less than. So, ought Q less than, ought QB, that's the between us, ought Q with the circular ordering, ought Q with the separation relation, or sim Q. So, there was some sense that our arguments had a good chance of pushing through to, to handling that. The problem is somehow that the, these kind of assumptions aren't very... The natural approach is to do some sort of induction on the degree of transitivity. But this kind of orbit equivalent assumption does not seem to fit very well with that. <coughs> I'll just say a word about the methods in proving this. <coughs> So, I want to say that G acts locally rigidly on X. Um, if for all finite U contained in X, there is finite V with will be contain, containing you, such that, well, I'll use this notation, the setwise stabilizer of V 
fixes u point wise. So u lives inside v, and any element of g which fixes v set wise must fix u point wise. So, so in, again, in Claude's language, v freezes, freezes u, is the idea. And then there's, a, there's an easy lemma which I have to leave, but um, that um, if H containing G are, um, are closed um, orbit equivalent <laughs> and G acts locally rigidly, then H equals G. So that's just a few lines to, to prove that. Um, so we want to show that in this sort of situation, where G is primitive, not too transitive, then G acts locally rigidly. Okay. So there are really, really two cases. Um, <coughs> case one would be where G acts too homogeneously on X. We know it's not too transitive. In this case, it's too homogeneous. So that means it's transitive on unordered pairs of elements. So in this case, there's, um, there's a tournament structure on X preserved by G. So then there is a tournament T on X such that B to K dot T. All you do is you, I mean, we know that G is not too transitive on X. So you take, an, you take one of the two orbits on ordered pairs from X. And that orbit will be the arc set of a tournament. Um, and, and now you show that um, you show that um, T is what we call co-finally rigid. So it's strong. Um, there, are sort of, there are sort of combinatorial versions of this local rigidity, where you say that a structure is locally rigid. And, yet, and, and this, this is a stronger notion. So this is just saying that um, for all finite U subtotals of T, there is finite V such that uh, uh, there is finite rigid V, so no automorphisms, such that U in V in T. So you, <coughs> you find rigid, rigid things around. Essentially, I mean, tournaments are trying hard to be rigid because finite total orders are rigid. Um, and, so, and, and, the, and then, because this tournament is invariant under G, once you can prove that, then you apply the lemma, and that completely handles this case. And the other case is, is when it's, it's not too homogeneous. Um, <coughs> and then there's an invariant graph. <coughs> uh, so case two, G not too homogeneous. Then, the, then um, there is a a G invariant graph on X. So that'll be one of the orbits on unordered pairs. And you, you work, you do similar arguments as here. So you, you, aim, you aim for a sort of local rigidity result to that graph. But it's a bit more complicated. I mean, what actually happens is that you find an invariant partial order as well. And it's the combined structure of the graph and the partial order, which is locally rigid. OK, so I'll stop there.